general overview of managing programs for all the different diseases we've talked about. The best place to start is by starting with the best horticultural practices. And in, in this day and age, I believe that the high density plantings are the best possible um, planting system for disease. Yes, while they may be uh, younger, smaller, and maybe a little more susceptible to the movement spread of fire blight, they're always better for color, better for yield, better for getting your fungicide coverage, better for drying time and air circulation, which can often be the best form of protection for disease. And if you look down at the, the tall spindle planting down below at 1200 trees to the acre, you can easily see how much easier that would be to cover, how much better dry, how much better and shorter drying time is gonna be needed to keep those um, fruit and leaves dry as compared, compared to the tall spindle semi-dwarf orchard, which kind of looks like a jungle and would just be a haven for disease, even as clean as that particular one looks. So with that, Another thing to consider is water management. Always make sure to pick the best sites. If a site doesn't look great, just don't even bother to plant in it. It might end up causing more trouble than it's worth. Always make sure to tile your orchards, keep that drip irrigation well managed so that the trees have it when it's right and so that there's never a hard pan forming. And on top of hard pan can be another uh, source of water which can get up into the trees and increase humidity, um, lead to weed problems, and just make your whole air circulation worse. And so water management is key, drying is key. If something is dry, fungi and bacteria just don't like it. They need those things to really get in there and cause problem. Along those lines, sanitation is foremost importance. You can almost manage all the diseases before you even get to the sprayer if you do all the other things very, very effectively. Um, fruit drops, leaf litter, prunings, anything that's dead and not useful, get it out of there. All of that does is that's where all the diseases like to live in the winter. Right now, they're living on all those materials, particularly leaves, old fruit drops, particularly cankers on pieces of wood. If the wood is no longer useful, get rid of it. You can see in this picture here of an orchard in Brazil, they ran one of these paddling machines down here that swept everything away, even exposed the sod a little bit, chucked it in there, and then they'll come down and get rid and collect it and chop it up later. What your options would be to also, if you don't have one of those machines, try um, a leaf um, shredding type of um, mower. That will also help you rake everything into the middles. You can scalp the side, you can put down urea or dolomitic lime. And what this will do is add extra nitrogen to the system to let the natural microbes of the environment have a uh, free for all and just dissolve all the materials for you and eat it up. All the wood decay fungi are actually pretty good with the exception of one or two that we don't have a problem with in New York. And so in that particular instance, let them decay your apple scab, let them decay your bitter rot, let them decay any old piece of wood on the ground. You can follow this up with a nice delayed dormant application of copper at silver tip, works on fire blight. If any cankers are oozing, you'll get them. It burns out any overwintering canidia or other structures and protects against those early infections from things like apple scab and all the other ascomycetes, including weird things like powdery mildew, bitter rot that all might be hiding inside nooks and crannies on tissues. It just gets a lot of the things really clean before you go into the season. When you can, use resistant cultivars. And there's a lot, um, but they're principally for apple scab. All the ones that I've shown here are apple scab resistant cultivars. Even something like Honeycrisp has a good bit of uh, resistance to apple scab. It's pretty much almost immune. And while they're immune to apple scab, a lot of them all um, really capitalize on this one single gene. And um, it doesn't give you resistance to all the other diseases like topaz can get phytophthora root rot. You might still get powdery mildew. You might still get bitter rot. But the nice thing about this gene and, and the reason we've been able to have it so long is it doesn't help with all the other diseases. And you still need to make a couple extra sprays. And so even if you have an apple scab variety that is completely immune to apple scab, you're putting on other stuff for other diseases. You'll help keep that gene's utility around for quite some time in the future. Um, there are some good information here out of my colleague of Ace Con's um, program. He's put together a really cool tool on the disease susceptibility of common apples. And it has things like fire blight, apple scab, and powdery mildew in it, even some cedar apple rust. But unfortunately, there's not all the diseases aren't actually included. Little is known about some of the resistance and susceptibility of some of the other things that we particularly talk about, such as the fruit rots and the fly speck study blotch. But for the big ones, um, the information is there. And you can use the tool to help pick the best cultivars for your 
operation. If you're up along the lakes and it's really dry and you get a lot of wind, it may not be the best place to um, plant a bunch of powdery mildew susceptible cultivars, but it might be great if you wanted to plant one that's more resistant to apple scab if it's a little more dry in that region. So that's how you can kind of use these to the, to the best of your ability. And speaking of apple scab, let's go ahead and take a look. And so this is sort of our sort of management scheme for apple scab. Um, the management program begins in the fall or the spring. And when you do it depends on when you can typically get, get into the orchard. If you can't drive in your orchard in the spring because the snow melt takes too long or it never dries out, put your urea on in the fall. And then as soon as you can, as you're going into the spring and bud breaks, try to get that silver to green tip to even if you have to go half inch green of copper. It's going to get the apple scab, it's going to get others. What's happening under the leaf letters is this ugly looking thing called a pseudothesium is making these little sort of tubes in it. And inside it are those ascospores that you're constantly hearing about maturing and ejecting. And what those are doing is they're ejecting out here and they're trying to land on your green tip. But you know what? You put on an application of copper and they germinate and die. And that's awesome. And then as you begin to move on later into the program, you can begin to do different phases of management. And how this um, practices might help your epidemic is you, you can look at this disease progress uh, curve, if you will, and this shows apple scab incidence over time as you're getting to harvest. And your goal is to get the harvest with no apple scab. If you do things like urea, this helps get rid and degrade these pseudothesia, degrade all this leaf litter. And what that does is that when it's time for them to mature, there's just fewer of them around and it effectively grabs your curb and pushes the start date closer to harvest. The same with that silver tip copper. Yes, some creep through, but you put it out there and it's on the surface of the um, plants. And it also stops some of that initial inoculum. It's like keeping the stuff away from your plants when it's trying to get in. And if you do both, in theory, you could have a very clean year. I mean, right now I've listed the, the push as ending with a 33% um, disease incidence of apple scab. But in the real, in the real world, if it was a warm season, this could get pushed so much that it doesn't even really develop and you'd see none without doing any fungicides. It's all theoretically possible. However, um, it's always best practice than then to go after the apple scab later. You'll be constantly protecting from green tip to bloom. And this is where you can get some early infections. And once these infections take place, they will make a different spore that behaves very similarly to an ascospore. It doesn't have to mature as quickly or it doesn't take as long to mature, and it can have many, many infections where the first lesions on that cluster will then reinfect and then cause really large gross lesions on your fruit over time. And this will keep happening over and over within every 10 to 14 to 21 days during the growing season if there's enough rain. But if you're putting on these protectant fungicides and then coming back with single site fungicides from bloom to second cover, um, you can also sort of suppress these stages. What this stage does, this stage where it infects all the time, is it takes that initial inoculum and just ramps it right up to a high level of apple scab. But if you're constantly putting these fungicides on to beat that down, it's like you're taking the speed or that slope of the line that's really going up fast and just pushing it down flat. And to the point where if you're using green tip to bloom, it's going to push it some. And then you're going from bloom to second cover, it's going to push it even harder towards the ground. You want that line to be lying on the ground so there's no apple scab. And if you do things like anti-sporulant fungicide applications, like such as a QOI, these things, when they form, won't even sporulate and contribute to the problem. And then even though I showed this rather gross extreme example with it getting up to 60, if you do this, typically the lines are just sitting there on the ground and you've never seen apple scab. And that's how you save the day. So in summary, um, when you go after that primary apple scab, this infection here, those silly things called the ascospores are infecting. You really go, it's often about five to seven days from green tip to petal fall, depending on how much rain you have. And this is a time period where you can sort of rely on the protectants, the captan, the mancozab, the sulfur, and the dodine, which often will behave a lot like a um, modern single site fungicide in terms of its efficacy, but it can only be used twice before you get to pink. And that's the final um, application limit for that particular material. And it's very good. Once you begin to move on later and you start to see cluster fruit, hopefully they won't have apple scab on them. That's when you go with these single sites. They're going to pick up a lot of the other diseases that are problems at this time, as well as go for apple scab. And depending on how much rain you have, 
you may want to go all the way out to third cover before starting your summer program, particularly if we have one of these years where it never stops raining at petal fall. If we get a lot of petal fall rain, it may be important to keep that, that interval going and keep up the cover because um, sometimes it can be so much and you just won't escape whatsoever. Let's talk about fire blight. Similar situation. What do we have in fire blight? Uh, well, it begins with the summer or fall pruning. Maybe there's been some fire blight strikes. Maybe you didn't see any. And there's nothing to prune out, but maybe you did some winter pruning. And what this is doing is you're getting the fire blight inoculum out of there. Every drop of ooze is billions and billions or yeah, maybe billions of cells. And if you can get rid of that, take that out of the orchard, it's going to be very helpful. And I'll show you how that works momentarily. Well, what will happen is the canker, you may not see it. It may be something you do see but don't have time to cut out. It might ooze. And then in the spring, wind, rain, insects, it's very sugary will grab that canker and they might come over and land on a newly opened flower. The bacteria will get on the stigmatic surface of the flower. And then if a rain comes, it'll be multiplying with the heat that we have at bloom. And this is why the hotter weather at bloom, the faster that bacteria is going to go. A rain will come and it will wash it down into the floral cup and cause this awful blossom light. And it doesn't end there. What ends up happening at this point, you might think, well, I don't need to worry about heat anymore. Heat will still make the bacteria inside the plant evade, invade, and rip through the tissues incredibly quickly. And it will make it multiply so much that it will ooze out again. And in this particular instance, once it's oozed out, it will then be able to be carried again by insects to new shoots. And all it takes is a young shoot even swatting against a guide wire, um, wires rubbing, two branches rubbing together. It doesn't always take hail and deer um, running through the orchard, eating like crazy. Any little bit of damage can be enough to get that fire blight bacteria back inside and going. And it'll just move through the plants to the active growing shoot tips. If it's really bad, you might even see oozing fruit. And then it will begin again in the fall with or late summer with the blighted shoots. If you can get to, not in this case harvest for fire blight, but terminal bud set, you can save the day. Similar to the apple scab, we have these disease progress curves. We do nothing, the disease will just ramp up and just kill the whole crop if you have fire blight in the area. Now, not all cases you're going to have it, but you can always start your best foot off with like pruning anything out and getting rid of cankers, getting rid of trees that were too devastated by fire blight. That grabs that curve and just pushes you closer to terminal bud set before the disease starts. The same with silver tip copper. And just like we saw with apple scab, it's the same thing taking all what any inoculum that you had there and getting it out you push it so close to the harvest or terminal bud set that by the time the disease takes off oh you only have one shoot with fire blight you cut it out and you laugh all the way to the bank um because you defeated it and then from that point which you can also do just like with apple scab you once the disease gets to this phase you can work on it a little bit in that initial inoculum with the antibiotics and biologicals but after that point, once you start moving into this phase where it starts reinfecting itself, the curves of those lines will just shoot up really fast. Fire blight will develop very quickly. And this is where your defense inducers, the SARs, the PGRs like Prohex, and even sanitation will then take those curves and flatten it um, to the bottom where you don't see any fire blight, and then you save the day. And so each one of these things contributes a little bit. And your goal is to take that curve and push it to the bottom, until you hit the terminal bud set and the plant stops growing. Because once the plant isn't growing, even if it's still hot, fire blight can't do anything. I've had many trials fail trying to inoculate too late in the season when the plant's not growing very heavily. So if you can get to the part where the plant stops, um, it can be as hot as it wants, and it's probably not going to do that much um, for fire blight. So wrapping this back up preseason, we have delayed dormant fixed copper application when the warm when the weather warms, nice picture of us air um, hand gunning a tree. That's just so massive that no one want to grow this type anymore. But this tree could be loaded with cankers. And that warm weather causes those cankers to ooze. And you just coat those cankers with a nice copper, 15 to 30 percent. The, the powdery coppers work the best because they stick, they stay longer. But um, you might have to recover if everything is growing very fast. And then bloom. Um, keep an eye out on what your consultant, your extension, um, alerts are subscribe to various um, the newsletters of the fruit program teams in eastern and western New York. Watch what everybody's saying, and you know what the heck, run the disease forecasting fire blight models and newer for yourself. And this will let you know when the best time is to really get those blossoms. And if something doesn't agree with what you're seeing outside, always go with what you're seeing. Um, 
We all can't look in your orchard and tell you that the flowers are blooming, but you know when they're blooming and you know how many of them are blooming. And that's where things get really intense. You know if it's actually rained on your farm, regardless of what the model says or anyone else tells you. Briefly, back with powdery mildew. It's going to be another same thing. We've often wondered, could we do a lot here with some of the stuff that we do for apple scab? That sanitation, the silver tip, copper. Green, could we do something with green tip fungicides? You might ask why. Well, what ends up happening when powdery mildew is if it gets a big infection the previous year, there are little canidia living inside the buds. And these buds break, and then they make really gross malformed shoots and flower clusters that are just covered with canidia. And right around, I'd say about paddle fall to late bloom is when, you know, you have to have young leaves out. This is how this fungus works. And if there's no young leaves out, it's not going to cause any infections. Right around the time the shoots are growing, these things are bursting forth with inoculum. And if we often wondered, could we reduce this part right here where these things burst forth? Could we burn the powdery mildew out of buds so that you don't have this and you don't even have to bother spraying with it most of the season? So that's an idea. But what we usually do is kind of the same thing as we always do before. Usually the green tip fungicides from green tip to pink don't do much. It's really not an active time for powdery mildew. But the materials that we often put on like Captain and Mancozeb and copper aren't as effective, but you know, we've often wondered, what if we did put an effective one there? What would that do? But where you're really getting a lot of your um, fungicide mileage are all those single sites. And I mentioned bringing them into apple scab from about pink or petal fall, the second cover, and you're going to avoid any trouble with the protectant mixes and large tank mixes where things get complicated. You can pick some of these things that are more innocuous and it won't be cap 10 in there and you'll get your mildew and you'll get some of these other diseases and you'll take your own curve. In this case, it won't be apple scab. It'll be powdery mildew and just smush it to the bottom where you'll never see a single um, powdery mildew lesion. So beating this up, the one that we're really working on is the secondary powdery mildew. And unfortunately, cap 10 mancozeb aren't as effective. But fortunately, you can use cap 10 mancozeb early on for your apple scab program. And by the time it starts to get towards pink or late bloom, you can then begin to select fungicides that are better for um, powdery mildew. What works great? In the old days, DMI worked so well that it probably only needed one application for the entire season. Now there's a lot of resistance. And QOIs work pretty good, even in orchards where we believe we found resistance. And the SDHIs don't have resistance, but they're not as effective as the other two. And so in that case, that's when we always sort of recommended putting these things on from up to second or third cover for apple scab and they'll get powdery mildew, and they're going to get some of the other diseases that we've already talked about, the fruit rots and some of the foliar diseases. And could we use a model for powdery mildew? It's, uh, it's hard to say. But right now, while apple scab is more important, I think it's probably best to time our apple applications using the apple scab models and procedures. And with that, um, it sort of summarizes sort of the overview of all the different management things that one could do for the big diseases and concludes the video series. Um, thank you.